Good morning, good morning. I am excited because this is the week of Christmas. It's going to be an exciting week. I uh, ask you to get your Bibles. Let's turn to John chapter 7 and let's talk about does your family believe in you? Jesus didn't believe in him. So let's find out does your family believe in you? Here we go. Uh, here, let me turn my volume down here. And let's find out who is coming in a um, minute or so early. If you don't have your We Who Worship book and workbook, you should get it ordered. Let's start the new year together. Even if you can't be physically or even online with me in our School of Worship coming up January the 4th through the 8th, you could actually be working the book in the workbook. That would be your first one if you were coming for the first time. So you can go right on SalemFamilyMinistries.org and you can order your We Who Worship book and workbook. I would suggest you call 918-639-1747 and register for the online school. You will be literally online with us. You won't. It won't be tape delayed. It won't be later videos. It will be online. You could actually watch it later if you couldn't be with us via live and in person but we do it live and in person so you can react and respond and ask questions and that way we can uh, monitor what you might have to say what you might have to do and you'll be uh, doing the work also reminding you if you have not read the presence of angels in your life you need to read this book it will help you learn how the supernatural realm works with, with the natural realm Distractions from Destiny, a great book to start your year with. I'm just trying to get you going, get your library built up. If you don't know how to pray legally in the court of heaven, you need Women of the Nation Pray, learning how to walk uh, strategically, organized, and unified, and uh, entering rest, be still, learning how to be still in his presence and hear his voice. And of course, if you don't have my brand new Worship Soaking CD called Enter In, I would suggest you order the CD. It has the free download in it, or you can just download it directly to your devices. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Tish. Good morning, Ms. Diedrich. Um, I uh, am, let's see, I'm not sure. I'm sorry, I almost answered a question incorrectly. Uh, good morning, Jean. Good morning, um, hmm. Sherry from Sugar Hill, Georgia. Good morning. Good morning, Celinda. Good morning, Laura Coconauer. Michelle Almarez. Good morning. Sunny. Good morning, Kim. Good morning, Ruth Thompson. Good morning, or evening in your case. The Ellies. Good morning, Gabby. Uh, Savannah. Good morning, Colby. Uh, wish I could stay, but have to catch it on replay. That's fine, Colby. Thank you so much for sending in a prayer for Mary Catherine. We used it today. If uh, you all have not read it, you should go on my Facebook page and read and you should be doing that please with me every day praying for mary catherine they did get her moved to a rehab center in jackson mississippi on friday she had a little bit of rehab on saturday not much a rest day yesterday and they started intensely with her at 8 a.m this morning so uh, i'm just asking for you to pray and that she respond to the rehabilitation to the stimulation uh, they are actually getting her up and getting her dressed, trying to get her to move, which she hasn't on her own yet, no response. But I believe in the spirit that she is responding in Jesus' name. Good morning, Lacey. Glad you're with me this morning. Good morning, Deborah. Glad you're all here. Let's get into John chapter 7. What a powerful chapter uh, to deal with um, our own, uh, who we are, uh, depending on whether people believe in us or not. Uh, Jesus was surrounded by his family. He had brothers, he had sister, his mom. Uh, there's no mention of Joseph, so I'm assuming by this point in history, Joseph is gone, which would be pretty normal. The lifespan of a person was not really long during the time of Jesus. They died quite early. So uh, Joseph would be somewhere probably around 50 when Jesus entered his ministry at 30 and maybe not even that he might have been 15 which would have made him about 45 who knows how old he was but i do know this um he seemed to be out of the picture by now so he's probably gone and then in this first um few verses of john 7 we find out that his own brothers don't believe uh in who he is and the theme of this chapter is that um, jesus goes on and does what he's called to do and he is who 
He knows he is. His identity is secure in the Father God. Even though those closest to him, now we know Mary believed in him. She knew. She didn't just say, I believe, but she knew that she knew that she knew, which is what I call a deeper level of faith. It is a place where no one could ever talk you out of it because it's not like you're saying, I believe. Help my unbelief. That's one level of belief. That's like the beginning level. But she was way past that. The angel spoke to her. She knew how she got pregnant. There was no doubt in her mind that Jesus, the very first son that she birthed, was the son of God and was the Messiah. So there was no, I believe he is who he says he is. Mm -mm. She knew before he knew, I believe, who, who Jesus was. So absolutely Mary believed in him and he knew that and felt that support. His brothers did not believe in him. The people do not believe in him, which you're going to see. They loved the miracles, but they didn't believe in who he was. And so he has to go on without the support of those around him who would say, I believe in you. He did not have that encouragement. He did not have that constant um, gratification. Uh, I call that the applause of soul uh, that most people feel like they have to have to go on. And the truth is, all that tells me when you have to have the applause of soul from others is that you don't even believe in yourself. Jesus didn't have to believe in himself. He knows who he is. This is what I, I tried to explain a few days ago when I gave my testimony as Miss America. I learned very quickly, I'm not trying to convince them. I know the story. I know it's real. I lived it. I'm not making it up. I'm not adding to it, taking from it to make it fit people. I lived it. People can believe it or they don't have to believe it. I don't care one way or the other. It doesn't change what I know, whether people believe or not. And that's what you've got to come to, the conclusion. You, what do you know? Whether people believe it or not doesn't change it for you. You know it. You don't just believe it and you need accolades of people to, to endorse your belief system. You know that you know that you know what you know. And nobody else, whether they ever believe it or not, matters. It doesn't matter. You know. And that's the premise of which you fulfill the call of God on your life. So let's get into the scriptures and talk about this. The um, Spirit for Life starts this topic, this, this chapter, with Jesus' brothers disbelieve. In my Passion Translation, it starts it off Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacles. So we're having the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, according to, uh, or the Feast of Tents, and um, these were actually Jesus' half-brothers, for Joseph was his stepfather in, in the case of, of course, God was his father, Jesus was his stepfather, but Mary and Joseph birthed other children. And so these brothers, uh, coming up here in verse 3, they were his half-brothers, or um, so that your followers can see your miracles. Yeah, okay, so let's talk about what the brothers are going to say. After this, Jesus traveled extensively, throughout the province of Galilee. But he avoided the province of Judea, for he knew the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem were planning to have him killed. He knew it. He wasn't suspect of it. He didn't think they might. He knew that they were planning to have him killed. Now the annual Feast of Tabernacles, or Feast of Tents, was approaching. So Jesus' brothers came to advise him, saying, these would be his actual Mary sons, Joseph's sons, brothers. Why don't you leave the countryside villages and go to Judea where the crowds are? And of course the crowds were there because it was the Feast of Tents or the Feast of Tabernacles and uh, many people were in Jerusalem. And so they said, why don't you go where the crowds are so that your followers can see your miracles? Now notice they are talking to him brother to brother. They are not talking to him follower to Messiah. They're saying to him, you need to go where the crowds are. No one can see what you're doing here in the backwoods of Galilee. How do you expect to be successful and famous if you do all these things in secret? Now, how many of you figured out? <laughs> Jesus wasn't even concerned about being famous or successful. He was just doing what he sees the Father do. He was just obeying the Father God and to do the will of the Father. And I don't know about you, but I have discovered 
at 63, almost 64 years old, that doing the will of the Father generally does not make you either successful or famous. I'm not saying it, that you aren't successful or famous, but I'm saying the will of the Father only if it fulfills something concerning his will would you ever be successful or famous. So those two words need to leave your vocabulary and they need to leave your thinking and your mind. You cannot be thinking or judging God's anointing on your life depending on famous or successful in man's terms. These brothers are talking about the success of man, the famous of man, but Jesus knew that is not doing the will of the Father. Again, I'm not saying that being successful and famous is not the will of the Father. I was certainly thrust into both successful and famous when I became Miss America, but it was only, and I knew quickly, it was only to do the will of the Father. And I also knew that as quickly and as suddenly as it began, it would have a quickly and suddenly ending, and then I would have to be continually about the Father's business as I was for the whole year. Is this making sense? Does anyone have any questions about the words successful and famous? Is this making sense to everyone? Good morning, Jesse. I'm glad you and Rachel are with us, and I'm so glad you are registered for the online school. Good morning, Rhonda. Good morning, Lucy. Uh, thanks. Uh, I know Lucy and Celinda and Laura and Michelle all will be here with me. Good morning, Emily. Uh, I'm looking to Savannah. Good morning. Savannah will be with me here at the uh, school coming up. Um, let's see. Did I miss anyone else? Uh, good morning, Brandon. Celinda, I love all of you. Okay, great. So, success and famous are not the judging lines here. And Jesus obviously did, ju did not judge his obedience or his ministry accordingly to the success and the um, fame of man. Why, do you leave, why don't you leave the countryside villages and go to Judea where the crowds are so that your followers can see your miracles? No one can see what you're doing here on the backside of Galilee. How do you expect to be successful and famous if you do all these things in secret? Now is your time. Go to Jerusalem. Come out of hiding and show the world who you are. His brothers were pushing him, even though they didn't yet believe in him as the Savior. Interesting. They were pushing him. I find that so interesting. Um, let me just see if I can see anything. As translated from the Aramaic and implied in the Greek text, this fulfills the prophecy of Psalm 69, 8 and 9. Jesus responded, my time of being unveiled hasn't yet come, but any time is a suitable opportunity for you to gain man's approval. <laughs> Let's read that one again. My time of being unveiled hasn't yet come, but any time is a suitable opportunity for you to gain man's approval. Wow, did he just nail them to the wall and they probably didn't even catch it amazing the world can't hate you but it does me for i am exposing their evil deeds and let me just tell you flat out that you are in a battle that never ends as long as you're on the earth but you are a winner and you have to know that you're a winner so stop being all up in arms and getting all frustrated and down in the mouth because it's just one war right after another war this is not our home we are not home yet we are warring and battling and pressing and pushing and we are being pressed on every side. But we are not abandoned. We are in a warfare in an alien planet because we are citizens of heaven. Now, the world can't hate you, but it does me for I'm exposing their evil deeds. When you walk around with the light of God coming out of you, whether you mean to or not, you expose the evil in the hearts and the actions of evil in the lives of others. You can go ahead and celebrate the feast without me. My appointed time has not yet come. Jesus lingered in Galilee until his brothers had left for the feast in Jerusalem. Then later, Jesus took a back road and went into Jerusalem in secret. During the feast... 
The Jewish leaders kept looking for Jesus and asking around, Where is he? Have you seen him? A controversy was brewing among the people with so many differing opinions about Jesus. Whether he meant to be or not, he was already becoming famous or infamous even. He was definitely being talked about. Some were saying he's a good man, while others weren't convinced and insisted saying he's just a demigod. Yet the one was bold enough, yet no one was bold enough to speak out publicly on Jesus' behalf for fear of the Jewish leaders. Not until the feast was half over did Jesus finally appear in the temple. Not until the feast was half over did Jesus finally appear in the temple courts and began to speak. The Jewish leaders were astonished by what he taught, and he said, How and said, How did this man acquire such knowledge? He wasn't trained in our schools. Who taught him? So Jesus responded, I don't teach my own ideas, but the truth revealed to me by the one who sent me. If you want to test my teachings and discover where I received them, first be passionate to do God's will. <laughs> Woo! And then you will be able to discern if my teachings are from the heart of God or from my own opinions. That's just a little bit of a nugget thrown in there, isn't it? God says if you want to be able to discern, to use discernment, to have discernment, to know right from wrong, good from evil, you must first be passionate to do God's will. You must be passionate to do God's will. So I want you to put that in the comments if you are. I want you to say, I am passionate to do God's will. I am passionate to do God's will. And as you write that, let the spirit of wisdom and revelation and discernment come upon you. Even as you write, I am passionate to do God's will. Let that spirit of wisdom, revelation, and discernment come upon you right now. And then you will be able to discern if my teachings are from the heart of God or from my own opinions. Charlatans praise themselves and seek honor from men. Hello. Charlatans praise themselves and seek honor from men. That's why you cannot care what people think or don't think. You cannot care if men open doors or don't open doors. It is God who opens and shuts the doors in my life. It is God who honors me as I honor him. It is God that I praise. I do not ever praise myself. I do not ever give myself accolades. I am constantly making sure I turn my back on humanity where I am an invisible worshiper and I turn my face to the God who created me so that I can fulfill the calling and receive the very fire of his image inside of me so that you can no longer see me. And I have no false motive that's the next thing I want you to say. If you are truly walking with God, I want you to write, I have no false motive. I have no false motives. I'm not going through life with a false motive. I'm not trying to underline, bring something to pass. I have nothing underlying. I have no agenda other than his agenda. Jesus is saying very simply, I don't have an agenda. I deny my own agenda as I lay down my life. I deny what I wanted to do and what I wanted to be. I laid all that down to be what he wants me to be, what he created me to be. Charlatans praise themselves and seek honor from men, but my father sent me to speak truth on his behalf. And I'm telling you, I speak truth on his behalf. And I know sometimes I've hurt your feelings. I don't mean to hurt your feelings. I just speak truth. I know sometimes when you come to my schools and we have our private sessions, sometimes I kind of get in your face. But it's not me. It's the Holy Ghost getting in your face. But Because I love you. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't bring anything up. I'd just say, what a good girl, what a good boy you are, and let you go on down the road in the same mess you're in. But I love you too much to leave you the way you are. If I really love you, I'm going to help you transition. 
I'm going to help you move to the next place and I'm going to expose the lies you tell yourself. That's a true pastor. That's a true mentor. I, I love you and I appreciate you and I see great gifts and great potential in you, but I'm going to mess with you if I'm following God's procedure, if I'm doing what God has called me to do as your mentor, as your teacher, even as your online pastor, I'm not going to let you just stay the way you were. I'm going to call you out of darkness into the light, including those dark areas you're used to living in and that you are accustomed to being in your mind. I'm not going to let you stay there if you want to continue on in a journey. Now, if you want to build a house and live in your mess, I won't pull you along. I'm not going to exhaust myself trying to get you to move forward, but I am going to help you. If you're ready to move, I'll help you pack. I'll help you move to the next place. And I have no false motive because I seek only the glory of God. Moses has given you the law, but not one of you is faithful to keep it. He was saying, you tried to live by the law, but you couldn't. That's why I came. He's saying, I had to come because you can't live by the law. So if you are lawbreakers, why then would you seek to kill me? Then some of the crowd shouted out, you must be out of your mind. Who's trying to kill you? <laughs> Good Lord, have mercy. Now remember, this is what the crowd said. You must be out of your mind. Who's trying to kill you? Jesus replied, I only had to do one miracle and all of you marvel. He's talking about the one that he did on the Sabbath. He's not talking about turning the water into wine that he did at the wedding, but when he made full circle and he went back to Cana and he went into the pool of Bethesda and he healed the man on the Sabbath. That's the one miracle that he's talking about. Yet isn't it Moses yes, yet isn't it true that Moses and your forefathers ordered you to circumcise your sons even if the eighth day fell on the Sabbath? So if you cut away part of a man on the Sabbath and that doesn't break the Jewish law why then would you be indignant with me for making a man completely healed on the Sabbath? Stop judging based on the superficial. Whoa, ho, ho, ho. let's stop and just say that again. Stop judging on the superficial. You cannot judge on the outward appearance of a man. You cannot judge a person on, on their skin color or the way they talk or an accent they may have or not have. You cannot judge a person by the way they appear or they look. You cannot judge a person because he's poor or judge another because he's rich. You cannot judge a person on their outward appearance. This says stop judging based on superficial, by what you can see, by the five physical senses. Stop judging on the superficial and be the body of Christ. Act like a body. Be the white blood cells of the body of Christ. When there's trouble, run to the trouble to help each other. Be the platelets in the blood that stops the bleeding. Be the white blood cells that stop the infection and run to help and fight what's wrong in the body. Instead of what do we do? We turn and point a finger and say, well, I wonder what's going on in their life. Look how harshly they're being judged. Stop it. Stop it. Stop judging based on the superficial. First, you must embrace the standards of mercy and truth. For remember, whatever level you sow is what will come back to you in a harvest. So when you sow mercy, when you sow truth, when you sow grace, you're going to have fields of mercy and truth and grace. But when you judge on the superficial, you're going to have fields of judgment on the superficial. And I don't know about you, but my life can't afford that. I can't stand the fa that kind of judgment. I can't stand that kind of harvest coming back. Every seed you sow will give birth after its own kind. Every seed will produce a harvest after its own kind. So don't be judging because then you're going to get a feel full, a harvest full of judgment coming back at you simply based upon by physical senses. Any comments here? Do we have any amens? Do we have any stop judging on the superficial? Isn't that amazing? That's right. Be the platelets that stop the bleeding. Be the white, be the white blood cells that, that fight the infection in the body. 
I forget now what the the red blood cells do. I forget its meaning. This is in my new book, um, The Three Stages of Life, and I just was editing that chapter yesterday. But we have to be the body and be the blood in the body. Uh, I, Gabby said, I'm packing as we study. I want to be purified, a dead woman walking for God. Uh, yes, ready to move, Mama. Yeah, we're packing. There's some preaching happening today. <laughs> Amen. Reveal the lies that we tell ourselves. I welcome that in my life. Absolutely. His agenda is what I live by. Amen, Brandon. I lay down my agenda. His will be done. I have no false motives. Absolutely. 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 Let's keep moving. This is a long chapter filled with so much revelation. So, stop judging on the superficial. Anybody want to tell me what verse I was on? Oh, there it is. Um, verse looks like 20. I'm not sure. First, you must embrace the standards of mercy and truth, 25. Then some of the residents of Jerusalem spoke up and said, Isn't this the one they're trying to kill? Oh, see, see. So some of the other crowd just said, Who's trying to kill you? This other one said, Isn't this the one they're trying to kill? So you see, the crowd's going to have multi dimensional opinions. Some will be for you, some will be against you, some will hear you, some won't hear you, some will listen, some won't listen, some will judge you, others won't. You're going to find that's why you can't worry about the crowd or the judgment or the opinion of people because opin people's opinions are all over the spectrum. So, so why is he here speaking publicly and not one of the Jewish leaders is doing anything about it? So now they're questioning. If the Jewish leaders are trying to kill him and he's stepped out and speaking publicly, are they starting to think that he's the anointed one? So now they're questioning. Hmm, maybe the leaders think he's the anointed one. Maybe the leaders think he's Messiah. But how could he be? Since we know this man is from Galilee, but no one will know where the true Messiah comes from, he'll just appear out of nowhere. Now, I, I have to stop here and say, this is so typical of people. Did you notice what they said? But how could he be, since we know this man is from Galilee, but no one will know where the true Messiah comes from, he'll just appear out of nowhere. Really? Where'd they come up with that statement? That's certainly not scripture. For the scripture tells them that he will come through the lineage of David. The scripture tells them that he will come from Bethlehem. And yet, they say he'll come from nowhere. You must be careful what you repeat and what you believe that you hear repeated once it comes through the telephone, you know, that old, that old uh, game we used to play, tell one, tell another, tell one, tell, and see how close the end result is to what the, fir the first line was. When you play telephone with the scripture, it changes from mouth to mouth to mouth to mouth. What does the word say? What does the word say? Back it up. These people are saying, oh, nobody knows where the Messiah is coming from. The scripture didn't say that at all. That's what they're saying. Here it goes on to say, Knowing all of this, Jesus one day preached boldly in the temple courts. So, you think you know me and where I come from, but you don't know the one who sent me, the Father who is always faithful. I have not come simply on my own initiative. The Father has sent me here, and I know all about him, for I have come from his presence. His words caused many to want to arrest him, but no man was able to lay a hand on him, for it wasn't yet his appointed time. And there were many people who thought he might be the Messiah. They said, after all, when the anointed one appears, could he possibly do more signs and wonders than this man has done? So when the Pharisees heard these rumors circulating about Jesus, they went into the leading priests and the temple guards to arrest him. Then Jesus said, My days to be with you are numbered. Then I will return to the one who sent me. And you will search for me and not be able to find me. See, that's a very sad thought to me. 
I think he is not only speaking physically, you will search for me and not be able to find me, but I think he was also speaking prophetically about those who try to find him from the natural. You're trying to find Jesus through your intellect, through your information, through your knowledge, and you can't find him that way. Uh, we have that scripture in Timothy where it talks about the weak and silly-minded women that are highly intelligent, very educated, and yet they can't find him because they're approaching him through much learning and much knowledge and not heart to heart. You cannot find Jesus through your intellect. You must find him through your heart. You must believe against your logic. You must approach him illogically to walk by faith and not by sight. You must leap out on nothing and nothing will become something under your feet. That's faith. The walk of faith is not a natural thing, nor can it be understood or approached from the natural realm. Jesus said, you will search for me and not be able to find me. For where I am, you cannot come. When the Jewish leaders heard this, they discussed among themselves, where could he possibly go that we won't be able to find him? Is he going to minister in a different land where our people live scattered among the nations? Is he going to teach those who are not Jews? What did he really mean by this statement, you will search for me and won't be able to find me? And where I am, you can't come. He really stumped them, didn't he? I just think that's an amazing thought, how he stumped them. Now, verse 37, rivers of living water. Then on the most important day of the feast, the last day. Don't you find that an interesting statement? Then on the most important day of the feast, the last day. I would say the most important day of your life will be the last day. I would say the most important days of history will be the last days, which we are in. These are the most important days, the last days. And what are we doing with them? Are we wasting them or are we utilizing them? Are we ever being the image of the Father, doing the will of the Father, calling the will of heaven to the earth? Then on the most important day of the feast, the last day, Jesus stood and shouted out to the crowds. He's not being quiet now. All you thirsty ones, come to me. Come to me and drink. Believe in me so that rivers of living water will burst out from within you, flowing from your innermost being, just like the scripture says. Oh, he's prophesying the Holy Ghost. He's prophesying the coming of the Holy Ghost. Believe in me so that rivers of living water will burst out from within you. Remember Savannah, the day you got filled with the Holy Ghost in Burbank, facing the wall in that room of people, and yet you were totally alone with God, and you got filled with the Holy Ghost, and yeah, bo rivers of living water begin to flow out of you right where you are, every one of you. Just stop for a moment and tap that artesian well of the rivers of the living water and let them flow out of you right now. Believe in me so that rivers of living water will burst out from your being, flowing from your innermost being, just like the scripture says. Jesus was prophesying about the Holy Spirit that believers were being prepared to receive, but the Holy Spirit had not yet been poured out upon them. Listen why. Because Jesus had not yet been unveiled in his full splendor. And the other translations say he had not yet received his glorified body after resurrection and at that point once he ascended he sent the holy spirit on the day of pentecost divided opinions about jesus when the crowd heard jesus words some said this man really is a prophet if you have any questions please ask them i would love to to answer anything yes savannah i agree with that the best day of your life and he stumps them in such simplicity it's true um, will come suddenly to his temple. That's right. Uh, was there 
thinking a reference to Malachi 3, 1 will come suddenly to his temple. Ooh, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, Sonny. I'm not, what, I'm not sure what they were thinking. I know they wanted him to set up a natural kingdom. And, and that's what the religious leaders were afraid of. And yet that's what the people wanted. And so that's why he was constantly eluding both groups. Those who were trying to make him a natural king and those who were seeking to kill him because the people were wanting to make him a natural king. So when the crowd heard Jesus' words, some said, this man really is a prophet. Others said, he's the Messiah. But others said, how could he be the anointed one since he's from Galilee? They didn't even investigate to find out where he was born. They just assumed. Let's never assume we know without investigating, without looking, without studying, without praying in the Holy Ghost. Don't assume you know anything until you've investigated the spirit and the truth. For the Father gets up from his throne and looks the whole earth over. John chapter 4, if you missed it. He searches the earth over looking for those who will approach him, will worship him in spirit and in truth. Don't the scriptures say that he will be one of David's descendants and be born in Bethlehem, the city of David? See, some of the crowd saying this where the others said, we don't know where the Messiah will come from. That's what the scriptures say. They obviously didn't know the scriptures at all. So the crowd was divided over Jesus. Some wanted him arrested, but no one dared to lay a hand on him. So when the temple guards returned to the Pharisees and the leading priests without Jesus, they were questioned, where is he? Why didn't you bring that man back with you? They answered, you don't understand. He speaks amazing things like no one else has ever spoken. The religious leaders mocked, oh, so now? You also have been led astray by him? Do you see even one of us, your leaders, following him? This ignorant rabble swarms around him because none of them know anything about the law. They're all cursed. That's what the religious leaders were saying because they were searching for Messiah. Just then Nicodemus, who had secretly spent time with Jesus, remember? We already covered this one who had secretly spent time with Jesus. Remember, if you're uh, remembering, he, he approached him. And, and I just have to give a couple of um, uh, scripture references here with the rivers of living water. Uh, uh, Sonny, would you please look up Isaiah 44, verse 3? Uh, that's right. Thank you, Sonny. There you go. You gave us John 4, 23. Would you also look up Isaiah 44, 3? And uh, Laura Kokenauer, would you please look up Isaiah 55, verse 1, and type these out, please? And uh, Lucy, would you look up Isaiah 58, verse 11? Celinda, would you please look, look up Ezekiel 47, verse 1? And then, uh, let's see who else is with me. T Pamela, would you please look up Revelations 22, Revelation 22, verse 1? A drink becomes a river. Woohoo! The rivers of living water will flow from his throne within. A drink becomes a river. So once the throne of God is set up inside of you through the Holy Spirit and you become the temple of the Holy Ghost, then that river begins to flow out of you. Uh, so now we are on verse uh, 40, no, 50. Just then Nicodemus, who had secretly spent time with Jesus, spoke up, for he was a respected voice among them. He cautioned, the, cautioned them, saying, Does our law decide a man's guilt before we first hear him and allow him to defend himself? See, Nicodemus really was suspect of believing in him. Uh, Nicodemus was really uh, leaning toward him. I want to read just a couple of um, comments below on verses 39 and 42. This splendor included the splendor of the cross, the splendor of his resurrection, and the glory of his ascension into heaven. Just as water poured out of the rock that was struck by Moses, so from the wounded side of Jesus, living water poured out to heal, save, and bring life to everyone who believes. 
And if any of you would please write out a page prayer for uh, my Mary Catherine and use scriptures, and this would be a great one to use as a precedent set in the court of heaven, and then email it to me, please, and then I will send it on to my brother after I edit it, so don't worry about the editing part. I'll edit it for you. But write out the, the prayer, please. Uh, the Holy Spirit poured out of Christ and into the church of Pentecost, at Pentecost. They had an understanding of the Bible but still missed who Jesus was. Bible knowledge alone without the Holy Spirit opening our hearts and bringing us to Christ can leave us as a skeptic. They jumped to conclusions not realizing that Jesus may have been raised in Nazareth in Galilee. But he was born in Bethlehem and was a true descendant of David. Now let's look up the references for that. Uh, those of you who can look up references. Brandon, could you look up, please? Uh, Brandon Sassman, could you look up Psalm 89, verses 3 and 4? Could you type in Psalm 89, verses 3 and 4? And Lacey, are you able to look up scripture for me? Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And Ruth Thompson, I know you're on the other side of the world. Can you look up Matthew 1, 1? And Sogol, I see you there. I'm so glad you're with us. Sogol, could you look up Matthew 2, Miss Pulley? Matthew 2, verse 1. Oh, and I see someone's joining us from Maui. I'm so glad you're with us. Um, uh, Kim Coleman, could you please look up Luke chapter 2, verse Four and type those out for me, please. We have these amazing references. Uh, what is my email to send the prayer? Simple. C-H-E-R-Y-L, Cheryl, at SalemFamilyMinistries.org. Cheryl, C-H-E-R-Y-L, at SalemFamilyMinistries.org. If someone would type that in for me, that would be awesome. Uh, and anyone who has a prayer, I would so appreciate it. Uh, right now. Okay, does our law decide a man's guilt before we first hear him and allow him to defend himself? Now, the last verse or two here, they argued, oh, so now you're an advocate for this Galilean. Search the scriptures, Nicodemus, and you'll see that there's no mention of a prophet coming out of Galilee. They just assume they know when they don't know. Please do not assume you know when you don't know. The Word of God has to back up everything you think you believe. And secondly, the Holy Spirit must confirm within you what you think you believe. That's why I wrote this angel book. Because so many people were having so many opinions and given so many personal experiences with angels without backing it up. With the scripture, that's why in the back of my angel book here, there's over 300 scriptures. What does the word say? I have had encounters that I have yet to be able to find a way to back them up with the scripture, so I don't share them. I don't share them. I'm not saying they're not real, but I'm saying I don't share what I came back up. You have to be able to back up with the scripture. There's a lot of people talking about a lot of things, and I can't back any of it up with the scripture. So... If you can't back it up with the scripture, I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm saying that you can't teach it. You can't preach it. We need to be careful. People believe and they don't prove. They just believe what you say, especially if it tickles their ears or if it's something about, well, there's just three subjects people love. They love to talk about the supernatural. They love to talk about money and they love to talk about a diet none of which they want to put any feet to. They don't want to do what it takes to be healthy. They just want to talk about it. They want to take a pill. Uh, people want to be rich, but they don't want to tithe. Uh, they don't want to give. You know, so here we, here we have, we, people want the supernatural, but they don't want to live to the level of the supernatural. And, and, and I just encourage you to think about the supernatural realm. It's a realm. So if you say, oh, I, I want to see angels. Well, okay, great. But in that same realm are demons. You want to see them? Because you're going to. So you need to be careful 
what you think you want. You, you don't get to... <laughs> Just please be careful. I'm teaching you here now. I'm telling you the truth. Listen carefully. Think things through. Pray things through. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Let the Spirit and the truth reveal to you what God has for you. Don't just expect fairy dust. Okay? It's not going to happen. They apparently didn't know their own Jewish history. For the prophet Jonah in 580 B.C. came from Gathifer, a village only three miles from Nazareth. It is believed that Elijah... Nahum and Hosea also came from Galilee. Jesus' Galilean ministry was prophesied in Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. Laura Kokenauer, could you look up Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2 and type it out for us in the references? Here is, see, this, this is what we must be careful. Spouting off, making a statement, and we don't know. We haven't done all our research. We need to learn to be quiet more and listen more and only speak what you absolutely know. And and don't listen to people and don't do this yourself who say, well, it's in the Word. Okay, tell me where it is. Tell me this. Show me the Scripture. Show me. Show me where it is. Don't just say, oh, it's in the Word. Really? Where? I've heard people say, uh, the Bible says uh, God helps those who help themselves. That's no Scripture. People, Somebody just made that up. God helps those who help themselves. That's not scripture. But people say, oh, that's in the Bible. Show me. Show me where it is. I could give you statement after statement. People say, well, the Bible says it is no more in the Bible than, a, than I have two heads. But people say it. And so other people who don't research, other people who are spiritually lazy, believe what they're saying. Now secondhand stupid is being passed along. We must be careful that we do our homework, that we research, that we listen to the Spirit of God, that we, from the very beginning, is what this scripture said, that we have discernment and wisdom. And how do you get that? You seek God and His ways to obey Him, to believe Him, to be who He called and created you to be, to not be people pleasers or be running after the word of another person when you could be running after the word of God. There's so much powerful truth in chapter 7 here. I'm telling you, God is speaking to us. We must obey. We must listen. We must not be prompted on by people but only prompted on by the Spirit. Do you notice that Jesus didn't even listen to those closest to him, his own brothers? He did not listen to what they said. He did not obey what they said. He was not a people pleaser. And if you want to be a God pe pleaser, you cannot be a people pleaser. You've got to decide right now. You are either going to please God or you're going to please people, but you won't please both. And then when you become a people pleaser, you won't be pleased the people either because half the people believe this and the other half of the people believe this and then the, uh, uh, this group believes this. You'll, you'll displease people and you'll be frustrated and you'll be intimidated and you'll deal with all the soul realm issues of not knowing you'll lose your identity if you ever had it. Just please God. Run after him with all you got. Run after him with your heart. Open our eyes, Father, so that we can see. Open our ears so that we can hear. May we move by your Spirit. Listen to the Spirit of God. I love you all. It's precious, precious that you come with me. It blesses me. Anna, I'm so glad you're with me this morning. Thank you. Are you all reading the Scripture? Does your ministry sell study Bibles? Our ministry only has one Bible on on uh, the website right now, uh, but I am seriously considering seeing if I can find the Spirit Filled Life Bibles. Um, I think the Spirit Filled Life Bibles are some of my favorites. As an example, um, in 718, the word is unrighteousness, and the Strong's gives us the adakia, that is the word A D I K I A, adakia, and it means derived from it. 
negative, and the root dyke, right, misdeeds, injustice, moral wrongdoing, unjust acts, unrighteousness, iniquity. It is the opposite of truthfulness. It is the unrighteousness is the opposite of truthfulness. It is the opposite of faithfulness, and it is the opposite of rightness, unrighteousness. So it's pretty easy to see. And then the um, commentaries here are really quite amazing in the Spirit-Filled Life Bible. But this uh, Passion Translation is pretty powerful with the commentaries too. The man has done his homework, and they are very good. Uh, we also have the Isaiah and the Genesis translations on our uh, website. Um, yeah, Pamela, you're right. It is exhausting to people, please. I choose to be a God pleaser. and You'll be doing this all of your life. Um, but there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the, coast, the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. I want to only please God to Tasha. Thank you so much for being with me this morning. You are all precious to me. Um, Deborah DePriest, I would recommend this uh, Passion Translation if you don't have it. And you can help our ministry by ordering it today. I recommend Isaiah and Genesis. Those are separate books uh, translated uh, from this uh, Brian Simmons that translates uh, uh, the Passion Translation quite, quite good. Let's keep going through the book of John. Uh, don't forget tonight, Marriage Mondays, 6 p.m. Harry and I are talking about the differences between male and female, the differences in our relationship and how God can use the difference. And we can learn to celebrate one another in all of our difference in our relationships and enjoy one another, especially enjoying those people that are not like you. And uh, this is a real task, but it is a great joy in your life when you can learn to appreciate those who are not like you and celebrate those differences. So join us at six o'clock tonight. We always have a lot of fun. It is the one time of ministry that we laugh a lot because laughter is good like a medicine. So I love you all. I'll see you tonight at six o'clock West Coast time. And I will um, love on you all day and pray for you. You're precious to me.